How's it going, my lovely death disciples? So, good news for me. I'm able to, I have finished all of my final stuff, so I am now free for my spring break, so hooray for me. And, um, today in this video, we are playing the life and suffering of Sir Bronte, and we have just reached our youth in the last episode, and we had arrived in the capital city of Eterna after our graduation from, uh, Sir Tybalt's, uh, school. Uh, we did also run into our old childhood friend who, um, turns out she was a bit of a witch. So, uh, nice Sophia, but, um, and she doesn't quite like me for obvious reasons, um, including the fact that the only option, once again, I had was being a bit of a coward. And, um, I did have the option to turn Sophia over, but I didn't want to do that option because that, that's fucking terrible. Do not want to do that. Um, didn't want to do that. Um, and, uh, now we are just, uh, we also ran across a little bit of a schism going on between the old and the new faith, and, uh, I debated on the side of the new faith just for the sake of, like, uh, you know, seeing if the old faith stands up, and, uh, let's just say it didn't. All the arguments were just like, oh, well, they're wrong because that's not what our religion says, or things like that. I mean, it, it, he didn't really have a whole lot of proof, and he also was just like, you know, we're not all that bad, I mean, sure, we're the Inquisition, but we're not immediately arresting you or killing you because of a disagreement. Still have that option, though. So, uh, and you're still using it. Not that convincing. Anyway, so we're gonna continue on with our youthdom, so let's go ahead and see how things go from here. And yes, we have been a little bit scandalous listening to speeches of, uh, how the lots don't really matter and all that. The city that never sleeps. The next few weeks pass by in handwork and preparation for the coming entrance exam at the Imperial College. You grow more and more exhausted with each passing day, so much so that one night you fall asleep while studying another book. When you finally come to, you decide it is high time to get some recreation outside. I mean, after all that studying, I mean, sure, why not? The city of Eterna amazes you as you stroll through its splendid streets. It is another night, a different night, yet the city is beautiful still. The shining pillar is a slice of light against the dark night sky. The lamps on the facades of the buildings are lit. Night descends on the capital. You don't feel like going back to your books tonight. I mean, after all, they've been a little bit of a at this point. I mean, really. Anyway, uh, recently, you made the acquaintance of several young men. They are children of nobles of the mantle, just like you, sent to the capital to earn their noble titles at the college. You decide to seek them out. Your new friends are having a late dinner on the next street over, loudly discussing their plans for the night. Some speak eagerly of a dueling club, where you can see the most skilled and ardent duels in duelers in the Empire doing what they do best. You have never seen professional duelers fight. It must be far more exciting than father's fencing lessons or that fight in the ruins in Anizolte. And if luck favors you, perhaps you can even make useful contacts among the noble families in the capital. The others try to convince the rest to take a trip to a certain secret salon. The establishment is expecting a guest tonight, they say. A young lady who speaks about the true state of affairs in the Empire. There are many questions about the nature of the place and the identity of the mysterious speaker. But the young men have only one answer. They are forbidden to speak about this outside the club. However, they can take you there as long as you aren't afraid to learn a dangerous truth. <laughs> Ew, well, they don't know the true me. But if they did, they would know I have no issues. There are others still, drinking their fill of wine rather than eating. I'm sorry, is there no beer in your hands as of right now, or ale? I mean, wine's nice and all, but a little bit of variety never hurts. There are others still drinking their fill of wine rather than eating. Fencing, they say. Speeches? Nonsense. The place you ought to go to tonight, they claim, is the Markian Society. A gathering for those of common estate but uncommon opinions that offers pleasures for everyone. Pleasures of the palais, pleasures of drink, pleasures of the flesh. Is this 
is not heresy and a crime? Perhaps. And yet some of your newfound friends are eager to go there. Hmm. In the end, your group splits in three to spend the night as they see fit. What will it be? A contest featuring the best fencers in Eterna? An establishment both mysterious and dangerous? Or an encounter with people who defy their lot with audacity? You weigh your options. Ooh, all such good, wonderful options to learn how to fight and to kill. A salon with scandalous opinions, or perhaps maybe a place where the lot is defied and the pleasure of lust can be enjoyed. Hmm, you decide to learn from the Empire's best duelers, you choose to see this mysterious lady and listen to her dangerous speeches. You agree to join these people who have traded away the bliss of the hereafter for all the pleasures of life. Hmm. I mean, why not enjoy a little bit of pleasure? Why not enjoy yourself? You've been working very hard as a top student. There's no need to uh, restrain yourself from pleasures of life, a little reward for your hard efforts. Isn't that what the goddess of chaos would want? You wander through the alleyways of Eterna with your group of pleasure seekers until you finally reach a towering stone building with purple pillars. See, made the right choice. Even just one look and like, yep, I made the choice of imperial royalty. Such a show of wealth seems ludicrous. You would expect something more humble and modest for a society of commoners. The air inside is stuffy and filled with noise. You smell fragrance, tobacco, and sweat. The hallways are covered in soft carpets. People wander through the building dressed only in light cloaks that leave their chests and shoulders bare. You cannot tell which estate they belong to. The main hall is enormous. On the floor you see d dishes full of exquisite food, including meat, fruit, and sweets. There are many beds spread out across the hall in which men and women are engaged in shameless pleasures of the full flesh in full view. Their cries and moments fill the building with a cacophony of lust. In the very center of the hall is a circle of shouting people. Inside the circle are two half-naked men. One of them is busy... Oh, not quite what I had in mind. That's not as kinky. Unless you're into me DSM. In that case, maybe it is kinky for those, but not necessarily me. One of them is busy punching another in the face. You can see bone through their bloody knuckles. They keep fighting. What is going on here? I came here for the sex! What the hell is there with this fist fight? A man dressed in only a thin, translucent cloak offers you a cup of wine. You accept it and take several big gulps. Oh, blessed be to Lord Dionysus. The spirits warm your body and bring you the tranquility you desire. Next, you are offered a pipe with an odd smell about it. You hesitate, but still put it to your lips and inhale. The strange smell clouds your mind, but a few moments later your head feels clear and unexpectedly light. You stumble forward in this strange state, bumping into people until you reach the feast on the floor. The meat is incredulously delicious, or incredibly delicious, the wine too. Your doubts and fears are gone. This place is worth any risk. The cries of the other people in the house ring in your ears. Accept pleasure. Reject suffering. Why wait for the peak if bliss is waiting for us right here? A silly, intoxicated smile appears on your face. You nod and shove another piece of meat into your mouth. Strong arms wrap around your shoulders. A stunningly handsome young man has approached you. 
His flowing fair hair falls to his bare chest. He is dressed in nothing but a thin loincloth. He kisses and licks your fingers gently, then guides your hand to his chest. Oh, oh what a surprise, but I am not disappointed. Oops. Well, not anymore now. You hear a heavy blow and the front door is smashed to pieces. This and the sound of screams is enough to bring you back to your senses. Men in black cassocks with silver crosses around their necks barge into the building accompanied by armed guards. Next comes a terrifying shout. In the name of the Inquisition, you are all under arrest for the crime of heresy. Church. The half-naked men abdomen their... Uh, the half-naked men abandon their fight in the center of the hall and throw themselves at the Inquisitors. The bulky, gray-haired man with broken knuckles is among them. He takes a sword in the throat. His former opponent, a tall, thin young man, falls to the floor with a crossbow bolt in his bare chest. The others freeze, unable to move. They are bound by barely visible white threads, seemingly woven from the air. The divine power of the Inquisition's clergy. <laughs> Panic spreads throughout the house. Intoxicated and exposed men and women rush to the front door, but the Inquisitor's allies await them with their swords at the ready. You dash away from the door and into a room in, with an open window. You jump outside and run. Run until you are out of breath and out of strength. Your jacket was left inside and your torso, torso is uncovered. The cool night air does wonders to clear your head as the pillar lights your way through the alleyways. This is a from the twins. I have to wonder. The twins are supposed to represent order. So why do they go out of their way to help a being of chaos? Hmm. Such things avoid my understanding. Oh, my theology went off though. <laughs> At last you return to your lodging house and tumble into bed. Your feet hurt, your throat aches, your breath is ragged. Your eyes still see the horrors of the night. Grown men immobilized by the twins' divine power. Bloody bodies cut down by steel. Naked pleasure seekers with faces distorted by fear. Perhaps the Inquisition has rescued you from the worst error of your life. One that would have led you to the foot of the pillar. You fall asleep only at the sunrise. You and I have a very different perspective on how to think about this whole thing. But hey, we're 17 now. Oh wait, speaking of, maybe it probably was a good idea that, um, <clears throat> certain things didn't happen because, uh, I just remembered that this guy is technically a minor. I didn't think about that very well. Sorry about that. You are on your way to the largest library in Eterna to study for your entry exams. It's right next to the college. The streets are full of people. Everybody's excited. You hesitate for a few seconds and let your curiosity get the better of you and head towards the place where you will soon study. Before long, you hear the shouting. The Great Chancellor is about to give a speech about the future of the Empire. Although, to be fair... I do think that I made the most exciting choice. Guaranteed. Without a doubt. You cannot possibly miss this. You mix with the crowd and soon find a convenient place to listen. And watch what is about to unfold. Sorry, I was checking uh, how long I was recording. I don't know why. On the steps of the college, you see a small tribune guarded by two Archneans armed with swords. This is the first time you have ever seen an Archnean standing guard, let alone two of them. The doors of the college open to reveal a stately Archnean surrounded by the Honor Guard. It is he, Cornelius Tempest, Great Chancellor of the Empire, younger brother to the Emperor himself. Is he gonna look like Palpatine? I'm just thinking that because he's the Chancellor. I don't know why. He heads for the Tribune and casts a look over the square. It is full of people in awe and utter silence. Mmm, much thicker eyebrows, but... You know, I could see it. I could definitely see it. And much more, um, uh, much more obvious lips. 
but a little bit. A little bit of semblance, I would say. Long ago, humans witnessed the Arcnians' arrival. The two nations built the Empire side by side. I'm trying to do a Palpatine impression, how am I doing? Not doing the Sidious impression, I'm trying to do Palpatine. <laughs> I don't know why. The provinces joined us one by one, and Magra was the final province to attain the absolute might and majesty of the blessed Arcnian Empire. <clears throat> Yet there was another great event long before that. Four centuries ago, the twins had graced us with their presence. With their arrival, the twins granted us their will. They showed us their love and their law, and they granted us knowledge of what awaits us in the hereafter. They chose the dynasty of Tempest, which is your dynasty, you know? Just thought I'd point that out. Not suspicious at all. To rule the Empire. And from that day forth, our dynasty has ruled this land, ordained by the gods themselves. However, it is our duty to the twins not to seek power for power's sake, but rather to lead the Empire to further prosperity. And so, the Great Imperial Council is soon to review and adopt a new set of laws called the Creed. Under the Creed, all estates will be granted rights. Under the Creed, there will be one law for all Imperial citizens to obey, human or Arcanian, from the lowliest commoner to the Emperor himself. The strife among the estates will end. A single law will resolve all of our quarrels. Glory to the Empire. The Great Chancellor throws his arms into the air. The crowd murmurs and applauds in approval. Cornelius Tempest casts another look over the crowd and leaves. Well, what was the law? The crowd disperses. The sounds of agitated discussions are everywhere. Is it true that the Emperor's dynasty seeks to grant equal rights to all estates? What will happen to the Empire then? Well, well, power sort of decentralized a bit. Struggle for power. The girl from your past. Uh-oh. Oh, this is gonna be bad. Is she gonna set me on fire? I wouldn't blame her if she did, but uh, at the same time, I do not want to be set on fire. It is early morning. You have been awake since sunrise, studying. There is a knock at the door. Is it a letter from home or a hotel servant? You open the door and freeze stunned. Hello, Bronte. Hi, um, Sophia. Um, if I could offer a moment of explanation, I was not given any choices, choices that would have been in favor for you in any of those situations. I seriously don't know why. Okay, the first one was because I didn't have a whole lot of willpower stats. The second one was because, well, I couldn't prevent your first death, therefore I could not actually do anything to try and help you escape. So, um, with that, um, can we make up from that? Maybe. Just please don't set me on fire. I want. I wish to learn your witchly ways. I wish to know the ways of the witch from you. I mean, I myself am already a witch, you know, but I must learn more magic. Please, be my teacher. Before you stand, Sophia. The girl who used to live next door. She is all grown up now. She looks so different. But you would always recognize those blue eyes, no matter what. You gesture for her to come in. Sophia enters the room, glances around, and sits in an armchair. You eye the girl you used to know as you sit across from her. But the young woman you see now has little in common with the girl you used to know. There is cold steel in the way she looks at things. Her hair is cut short. What is she doing here? I can explain. I've been living in Eterna for a long time now. Ever since I ran away from Anizote. I heard the other day that you'd left for the capital get in to get into the college. So I found you, and here I am. You ask how Sophia learned about your arrival and where you were staying, but she answers your questions with an enigmatic, enigmatic smile. We'll get to that later. Right now I want to see how much you've changed since we last saw each other. As for me, I've changed a lot. I'm a whole different person now. You look away as you recall your previous encounter back when Sophia ran away from her Arcane Master. 
Sophia chuckles as she continues. Yeah, those chains of light. How is that considered a, a evil act? I mean, they are light. And as we seem to recall, light is a good thing in society, I think. Look, okay, humans, so you, you are Arcanians and as well. Like, you can never understand mortals. <clears throat> Would you like to know what happened next? I traveled through the entire empire all alone. I had nothing. My journey ended only when I reached this place. The capital. With all its important people and events. This is the heart of the empire. It's a place where I can make a difference. I've made friends here. Found people I can truly call my family. I've even gotten an education of sorts and I have a purpose now. I fight against injustice. I fight against the lots. I fight those who treat our lives like mud on the pavement. And no, I am not afraid to tell you that. I came to you for a good reason. I need help. I know you. I have faith in your good heart. You do? Even with all the choices I was forced to make? And besides, this is also about the Imperial College you want to enroll in. There is a scholar there by the name of Bartholomew Dextra. He teaches natural sciences at the college. Dextra is an old man, but he's quite progressive. He'll stop at nothing to advance science and acquire new knowledge. As you know, only second generation nobles or above are allowed to teach the college, but Dextra, he is a commoner. He forged his patent of nobility to get a position at the college, but the secret chancellery recently learned of this. Dextra is about to face true death for this forgery. But how is that justice? A man wants to teach people, and for this, they're going to take all his lives. They're going to punish him for the crime of being born in the wrong estate. It's evil and obscene, and I will not stand for it. Dextra deserves to be rescued. But I don't want to put anyone in danger, so I need your help. You're from a rich family. Well, meagerly rich, but I understand your point. You're almost a noble, and that is true as well. If you help me get Dextra out of the city, Nobody will suspect anything. No one will know, and the scholar will live. On to continue his research elsewhere, far away from the secret chancellery. Will you help me? <clears throat> you feel perplexed by Sophia's sudden request. She is asking you to break imperial law and undermine the work of the secret chancellery to save the scholar. Rescuing Dexter would be an adventure, but it would also be incredibly dangerous. Besides, Dexter is a fake noble, he resorted to lies and deceit to get his current position. How much does this matter to you? Sophia's blue eyes are studying you, waiting for your reply. Okay, I saw your girl, what's that do? You turn Sophia over to Aunt. If you help her now, it will make up for what you did to her. Okay, well, I most certainly did not do that, and definitely a good option because she would have hated me. Uh, but, uh, help her. Sophia is not feeling merciless against me. Uh, so, but yes, I will help her. You agree to help Sophia rescue Dextra? You promised to help Sophia. Bartholomew, uh, Bartholomew Dextra does not deserve this. He has to leave the capital. She can count on you. I know I could count on you. Then we must act at once. There's no time to waste. Dextra is to be arrested tomorrow. Here's his address. Go there as soon as the sun sets. No one will suspect you. Dextra often tutors young men from the college entrance exams. Tell him the owl sent you. Use the back door to get out. A carriage will drive up to the backyard. The driver will hoot like an owl. He'll take you to the south gate. If the guards stop the carriage, just talk your way out of it. Once you're outside the city, Dextra will ride away in a different carriage. You'll go back the way you came. I'll meet you in the Majesty Square. You nod to her words and your hands start to shake. You are about to go against the secret chancery. You are going to help someone escape punishment to defy your own law like this. It's unthinkable. When the sun sets, you leave the lodging house and walk quickly, glancing over your shoulder repeatedly. Bartholomew Dexter's house must be somewhere around here. You find the place. A genteel old man opens the door. His face is covered in wrinkles. His shoulders are stooped, and yet his eyes are sharp and lively. Bartholomew Dextra looks at you for a moment, then asks why you have paid him a visit. <clears throat> you tell him you want to enroll in the college and are looking for a tutor. Dextra nods and invites you in. Once you make sure nobody else can see or hear you, you 
whisper to the scholar about the real reason of your visit. The secret chancery will be coming for him tomorrow, and he has to leave now to escape true death. Also, code word? Dexter freezes, then turns to you. How do you know about him and the secret, secret chancery? Tell him that the owl sent you and is provided for his escape. As for the ch secret chancery, they want him for the forging, if, for forging a patent of nobility. The moment you utter Sophia's name, the lecture calms down and starts packing for the journey. You watch him distractedly and notice that he lives in a rather austere fashion. It does not take him long to pack. You hear the quiet clacking of hoofs in the yard. Carefully, you and Dexter proceed to the backyard of the building. You see a carriage there. The driver hoots quietly. You get in. The carriage rolls down the road. There is tense silence in the closed-off space inside the carriage. The scholar wrings his hands anxiously. Through the carriage windows, you see the massive city gate passing by. You are almost outside the city, but then a loud voice reaches you. Halt! The driver obediently halts the carriage. Two city gander, uh, gender, uh, gendars, I have never seen this word before, so I am sorry, approach you. You leave the carriage to face the gendarms before they can get a peek inside the carriage. They look you over and ask you wh where you are going so late at night. They you tell them you are the son of a judge in Magra, here to enroll in the college, and right now you wish to visit the estate of a newfound friend. To convince them further, you mention the name of a noble son you have become friendly with. The gendarmes release the carriage and wish you a pleasant trip. You drive along the high road until you encounter a peasant wagon. Dexter will take it to seek refuge too far away from the capital. Before the two of you part ways, he pats you on the shoulder and tells you that you have done a truly brave deed. You return to the city without incident. You find Sophia in Majesty Square as agreed, sitting on a bench by a streetlight, reading a book of some sort. She closes the book when she sees you and offers you her hand. So, did everything go according to plan? You nod. Then we've earned ourselves a bit of free time. Let's go. You set off on a walk through the maze of narrow back streets. Finally, you have some time for questions. What happened to Sophia over the last two years? She was just a girl before. A servant. How is she now a revolutionary? Sophia just smiles sadly. <clears throat> You've seen what I can do. I'm not just a girl. The Inquisition caught up with me when I ran away from El Nizote. I ended up in the House of Humility. A dreadful place. I got collared. Do you know how it feels to lose your free will? Losing everything that makes you, you. She unclasped the tall shirt collar that had been hiding her neck all this time. And an, and you see the round mark from the anti-magic collar. They say a scar like this will remain even after a lesser death. But I got lucky. Patriarch Junius Diamond saved me. Diamon took me and the other mages from the House of Humility and removed our collars. He made me one of his attendants. He told me that there are no lots. He told me that I am like this not because I'm a freak, but because it's my nature. He told me I can find a path to the twins like anyone else in the world. And then I was taken. I mean, I got out on my own. I found my own lot. To protect the common people from the noble yoke. To help others who are as unlucky as I am fight for a different world. A world where everybody has equal rights. A world where mages don't get robbed of their will just because of one aspect of their birth. A world where nobles no longer tread upon the commoners. Yes, this is our dream, but we are still so far away from it. But I will keep moving towards it, and I'll stop at nothing. A strange distorted expression appears on Sophia's face, but she quickly returns to normal. You keep walking until you are at your lodging house again. For a moment, you just stand there looking at each other. And suddenly, Sophia embraces you. For a moment, she remains still in your arms and whispers, You should join my cause. If we work together, one day, we'll become a force to be reckoned with. I know you came here to find your way, but I'll never believe you who truly want to bind yourself to other people's laws and desires for the rest of your life. The path I walk is dangerous. It's almost helpless. But it's worth living for. Think about it. Goodbye. Indifferent now. Okay. So she's no longer embittered. That's good. 
Then she withdraws just as quickly as she dis and disappears in the street dark streets of Eterna. You make your way back to your room, exhausted by the events of the day. Is this really just a single day in your life? Let's see now. Your former neighbor. She was in the service of the Arcne and Dorius Auden before fleeing Anizote in the capital. She became a rebel and founded the secret society of Elopolis. She is leading a fight against the Empire's unjust border. Scheming. Ooh, I've gotten better at scheming, eh? And Fowler. There we go. Like it. Love it. Love it so much. I will never forget that day. For it was then that I chose the path I would walk for the rest of my life. Wait, I did? Three lots. There are only a few days left until the Imperial College entrance exams. History, law, theology. You spend all day reading and rereading the books you brought with you, staying at the Library of Eterna for hours, sometimes until it closes. As the day of the exam approaches, your hands start shaking more and more. And finally, the day comes. A clear sky hangs over Eterna today. The breeze is warm. You dress in your you dress in your best outfit. A gray, silver, uh, uh, hold on there. I do love gray, but I think a silver jacket fits me much better. And velvet coulee trousers. You comb your hair carefully and polish your boots until they shine. You leave the lodging house and head for the Imperial College. Your legs grow heavier with each step. Your anxiety at the fate, at the fact your fate will be decided today is virtually tearing you apart. <laughs> The college is a majestic building that looks not unlike a castle. In the square in front of it, you can already see several dozen people. Young men, sons of nobles of the mantle like you, waiting for the college's doors to open. Time slows to a crawl. At last, the doors open. A stately man dressed in a professor's mantle appears at the entrance. He is the dean of the college. The students to be fall silent as the dean gets ready to deliver his welcoming speech. The silence is interrupted by heavy footsteps and clanking armor. A squadron of, roy of warriors emerge near the college, led by Arcanian officers. Their banners bear an image of golden grains. The noble militia of Monia province. What are they doing here? The nobles of Monia form a circle around the college, each warrior moving quietly and precisely until a chain is formed. One of the Arcanians is clad in an old-fashioned suit of armor. He is the leader of the militia. He locks the bar on the massive doors of the college into place seats the stairs to address the crowd loudly. Agarius Monrogue. Commoners, before you stands Agarius of the Monrogue dynasty, Archduke of Monia. By my will, the college is hereby closed and today's entrance exam is cancelled. Your lowly origins make you unfit for the great honor of rendering service to the Empire, a right that ought to, that ought to be only available to the hereditary nobles of the sword. Bitch. The college's reputation has been tarnished. It breeds mock nobles who bear not a trace of noble blood. You belong in the lowly estate, but have forgotten your place. Cornelius Tempest and other traitors to the empires are indulging you and defacing the institution of the nobility for their lowly interests. A noble lot for those of lowly birth? How could this be? I will not stand for this disintegration of the imperial order. Now turn away from the college this instance, and return to the humble trades of your ancestors. Plow your fields, mend your boots, and work, and suffer by your lot. If any of you dares to set foot upon these stairs, you will be killed at once. The students who be meet the speech with a stunned silence. The crowd in the square is growing. However, the news of the Monian noble militia and the college's closing spreads through the streets like wildfire. More humans join the crowd. College students, commoners, officials who worked hard to be a noble. Unrest grows around you. You hear people calling to rush Archduke Monrogue's forces to take control of the college and defend your right to become noble. The Emperor himself gave us this right. We have to fight for it. I mean, after all, are you here to defy the will of the Emperor, Archduke Monrogue? This is a decisive moment for all of you. The old gentry has challenged you. Will you accept this challenge? 
in the face of this shameful, illegal act by the Archduke's forces. You may prove that all you deserve the no that all of you deserve the noble lot. You will need to break through the court, get inside the college, and take control of it. The nobles will never dare hurt you if you are present if your presence is strong enough. If you are ready to risk it all and fight for your right to the nobility, you will have to lead the charge. People keep coming to the square in the meantime, including students and teachers from the Divine Seminary. The lot of the clergy is to guide others to the right path. When the estates clash, the priests are bound to intervene. The seminary teachers instruct their students to form a line between the noble militia and the outraged crowd. The priests begin telling the warrior nobles and their right and the riotous commoners to return to the preordained divine order, lest they provoke the wrath of the gods. The wrath of the gods, as the priests utter these words, the crowd around you disappears. The vision appears a vision appears before your eyes. The empire is ablaze. You see burning lands steeped with pain and despair everywhere. You look. Rivers overflowing to extinguish the burning world. You can tell that soil scorched by such fire will never be food again. The gods given vision demands to be heard, demands to be prophesied to the world, but only a priest may speak to the twins, and for the twins. Will you keep it inside? Or will you step onto the path the twins have revealed to you? Somebody shoves you in the back and you snap out of the vision. You turn around to see a small but decisive troop of commoners moving quickly through the crowd. They're led by... Sophia. As soon as she sees you, she signals to them to stop. So you're here too. You're going to rush the college, are you? Can't you see it already? The laws cannot be trusted. They gave you the right to study here just to throw you a bell. When the going gets tough, your masters will take it all away. It's time for you to decide. We are the lawless, and we are not putting up with this system any longer. We will fight for a new world. Are you coming with us? When are you going to submit? There are students and professors locked inside the college. Who knows how long Monroe will maintain this siege? And what if they start slaughtering people? Neither group of nobles will care what happens to them. We're going to go inside and pull them out. Come with us if you're ready to take control of your own destiny. The tension in the square is palpable, and the situation is about to implode. Students, commoners, nobles of the mantle, followers of the new faith, all of them are gathering their forces to move on the wall of soldiers. They expect the nobles to let them through en masse. Surely, they won't start a massacre. They expect the nobles to let them through on. Uh, oh, wait, oops. The lotless led by Sophia prepare to break through the siege to rescue the people in the college, and all the while the priests preach peace to both sides of the conflict. College is your only way into the nobility. Only you can fight for your new lot and fulfill your duty to your family. You could have organized an offensive strong enough to get into the college and thus seize your lawful right like a true nobleman. Yet the revelation about the wrath of the gods still pulses in your mind. Once revealed, this vision will take you, you on a different path. Standing with the priests and preaching what you have just seen, warning all the dire danger on the path of warring estates, bringing the twins' word to the people and guiding them to salvation. Could this be your new lot? Sophia and the Lotless, they expect you to join their struggle. They are waiting for you to cast off the old ways and the eternal yoke of subservience. If you choose this path, you will not change your lot and your suffering will continue. But your suffering might just change this world. This is the moment. Your future will be decided, and now. Break through the cordon into the college, Diplomacy less than 10, and Valor less than 10. Preach a revelation, I do not have Theology 10 or Eloquence of 10. Only one of these must be true though, but follow the lot list, that's the only one I can do, and there are no requirements for it. So, you join Sophia and her men, and try to rescue the besieged students. You have decided. The storm of doubt in your mind clears at last. You are done serving the will of others. You will defy your lot, and you do not need another. You are free already, and for this freedom you are ready to sacrifice anything. You walk to the lawless as Sophia smiles at you softly. Her companions pat you on the shoulder, and then you get to work. The lawless withdraw from the mob in the square and prepare for the raid. They are strong enough by they are strong people of lowly birth, and their clothes are covered in dirt and suit. They hang on Sophia's every word. So the plan is simple. I will go to the warriors by the side gate and distract them. You know me. I have my ways. The rest of you must get inside the college and lead the people outside. 
when you are done waiting for my signal. Sparks of yellow flash in Sophia's eyes. She walks with confidence to the nobles guarding the side gate. They meet her with drawn swords, and then a flash of yellow light fills their eyes. The warriors freeze in place. Sophia walks away, and they follow her obediently. The path is clear. You hear one of the lotless gasp in awe. That's our all, all right. She can do that. It's time. You open the gate and get inside the college, leaving the cries of the mob behind. Nobody stops you. Once this is done, you scatter to search the halls for students and professors. They are not too eager to trust the trespassing commoners, but with Arcane and swords hanging over their heads, they trust you anyways. Your student garb helps you convince them. You take everyone you can out of the college through the same, through the same unguarded gate. The lawless take a roll call in an alleyway behind the college. You've rescued almost two dozen men. Sophia's the last to reach you. It is time to leave. The maze of hidden alleyways takes you safely to a patch of abandoned land. Sophia clambers up onto her onto the half-crumbled wall of an old house. She lights her pipe and gestures confidently for everyone to come closer. Welcome all. And oh, I just realized Discord is uh, still on, so let me quickly. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. Did not mean for that to be a problem. Welcome all. We are the thoughtless. We are the people who will never stand for the injustice of the imperial system. We live as we see fit. We have no masters. Only our free will, our own free will. Join our ranks and you will be forever free from the whims of the Archneans and the Gentry. Walk away, and they will be free to do with you as they see fit. I believe today was a fair show of their intentions. The freed students exchange glances. If they join you, their hopes of being ennobled by the mantle will be cut short. They already saw how precarious their position is. Many of them are enraged by the fact that the Archneans can take their rights whenever they please. We won't force you to stay. You're free to leave and go back to the college when it opens. If it opens. But if you don't want to dance to their tune anymore. But if you don't want to dance to their tune anymore, a lot less welcome. Many students joined the ranks of the Lotless that day. You are among them. You are greeted by the motto of the Lotless. Our cause is just. Your new life has begun. Your life as a member of an outlaw brotherhood. There is no going back. You will be neither nobleman nor priest. Your father will never forgive you for letting the family down, but for the first time in your life, you feel truly free. You have defied your law. Now your fate is yours alone. What will happen next? I mean, he can't necessarily blame me. Path of the Lotless. Well, I mean, he could blame me, but he would be wrong in doing so. After all, they weren't gonna let me take my exams. What was I supposed to do? You remain in the common estate, with no choice but to fend for yourself and make your own way in the world. Remain a common. Bonds of friendship. You return to the lodging house one last time to gather your belongings for the move to your new home. A young man dressed in the uniform of the military academy greets you by the door. It takes you a moment to recognize Thomas. Your friend locks you in an embrace. Dante, hey, how are you? I heard about the nasty stuff that went down in the college square. This damn gentry, this damn gentry would do anything to keep lowborn folks under their thumb. Glad the situation resolved itself. As for me, I'm in an academy of cadet now. He is beaming with pride. You invite him in and chat while you pack. Thomas continues to relay the news as you walk up the stairs. I made it to the top ten. Can you imagine? You did pretty well in sparring in the sciences. It was all thanks to the help you gave me back in school in Anizote. I'll be studying the art of war now, and then it's a quick march to a noble title. How about you? That. You tell Thomas about what happened over the past few days, and of the path you have chosen. He remains quiet as you speak. Both of you realize that you may never see each other again. Yeah. I've 
are two brass rings. The old tradition is to be believed both the rings and their wearers will always remain close to each other. No matter what, where fate, no matter where fate takes them. What do you say? The two of you grew up side by side. Thomas, the audacious, hot-blooded, sharp-tongued boy who used to live next door. You can't imagine your childhood without him. But would it be right to promise him that your friendship will last forever? No matter what happens. Two rings made of plain brass lie in his open palm. If you wear these rings, you will be bound by ties of friendship for the rest of your life. The path of the nobleman. Take the ring that will bind your fate to Thomas' and swear an oath of eternal friendship. Take the ring. Do not get the path of the nobleman who had relations with Thomas Guerrero greater than three, or at three. You take the ring. Two of you have been friends for a long time. It seems unthinkable that your friendship could ever end. Keep things as they are. You are sure you will do your best to keep the friendship alive, but you cannot promise it will last forever. End the friendship. You are not the children you used to be. This is where you must part ways. one of the rings from his outstretched palm. The two of you walk side by side ever since you were children. Even though your paths in life may diverge, nothing will ever tarnish your bond. You are ready to preserve your friendship in brass forever. You put the brass ring on your pinky. Perfect fit. Thomas does the same. He starts beaming again. Now we're friends forever. For all eternity. We gotta celebrate this. Come, come. I know a place. I gotta show you taste the tastiest mead I've ever tried, Bronte. My treat. Bound by friendship. The two of you go to the noble salon by the square of Emperor Se Severin. Surrounded by tobacco smoke and mead bottles, you wag your tongue, recall the days of your adolescence, and make plans for the future. Nobody knows what could be waiting for you, but you promise you will never lose sight of each other. Your friendship is strong enough to stand the test of time. to get into the college. There is no other way. Father would have learned everything one way or another. It isn't an easy letter to write. He did send you to the capital specifically to attend the college, after all. You write about Archduke, Me Archduke Me Monroe's assault and the student's doubtful future now that their right to be ennobled by the mantle may be revoked. You tell them that you plan to get a job in the capital and earn a living. They should accept your choice. The reply from your family arrives very quickly sent you to the capital with a sole purpose, but you failed. Indeed, nobody expected an attack on the college, but you could have upheld your right to study there, had you been more firm. Cornelius Tempest will ensure the college opens again, yet you have already rejected the nobleman's lot. And to what end? You can only accept your choice now. But you will no longer receive any support from the family. It is up to you to earn your key. I can only hope that you will not disappear into the capital. A siege incident is nothing but a poor excuse. You failed to uphold your right to enter the college, and that is the end of it. It cost Father so much in time and money to send you to the capital, and you rejected it all. And for what? To remain a commoner until the end of your days? 
I hoped you would one day become my equal, but now the very thought of this is just absurd. There is another letter. It is from Gloria. It seems neither father nor Stefan knew she sent it. Sir Robert smashed her face. He smashed her face when as he read your letter. Stefan screamed at the top of his lungs about lowborn and foul thoughts. Fortunately, I led Mother and Nathan away before we all got in trouble. My father's will. He went against all expectations against this entire rotten system. He made this decision now. Now follow it to the end. I believe this path will lead you somewhere worthy. Take good care of yourself, my brother. Well, I have sympathy for him. I have sympathy. Lawless. You cast one final glance over the room where you lived for so long. Here is the table at which you sat studying all those books. Here is the bed on which you dreamed your dreams of the future. Your things are packed. You walk down the stairs. The landlord's servile smile is gone now. The unspent remainder of the funds allocated from your accommodations drop onto the counter from his reluctant hand, and then he turns away. You have no lot now. You are free. Free even from the knowledge of your tomorrow. You have cast away your destiny. But for what? This remains to be seen. The Bronte family will support you no longer. But you have to find a, play to a place to stay in the capital so you can aid the lotless. And so, you seek Sophia. I'm afraid I can't uh, offer you a noble estate. But we found a basement in an abandoned house and made it into our home. It's on the bank of Reglata, by the river port. It's livable. There's only one room for everyone, so bring your own bedding. But it's warm and clean, and we have food and a place to keep our things. You'll be safe. After all those carriage rides, going through the city streets on foot isn't half bad. The bayside wind still gets under your skin, but it also cools you down on hot days. Not that you need it. You were born in Anizote, in the very southernmost part of the Empire, and the hot season in the capital is nothing compared to the real heat of Magra. You recall all the hot days in the garden, sitting with father and talking. About the lots, about your future in the capital. He used to look at you with such pride. He was so confident you would follow in his footsteps. A chilling gust of wind snaps you out of it. Enough nostalgia. It's time to face the future you have chosen for yourself. The house where the lotless live in close to, is close to the port. The basement entrance is hard to find, but you eventually locate it. Inside is one large room with bedding and belongings strewn about all over the floor. You find some free space in one of the corners, so you place your bedding and your things ne nearby. Then you take a good look around. There is only a handful of people in the building. You introduce yourselves to them. They show you the utilities, a small kitchen and a room with a stove and several buckets of water. If you need more water, the river is right nearby. You ask them how long they have lived here. About eight months, one of the lotless tells you. They took over this basement back when they only had ten members. Most of them were more or less homeless. Disowned by their families, expelled from college, academy, or seminary, Sophia found a place where they could live together. Everyone sleeps in the basement and meets in the abandoned house above. Sophia certainly is thoughtful, you would tell. Sophia certainly is thoughtful, you would tell. That she is, your fellow lotless say, nodding. She takes good care of us, but she's also really secretive and demands that we follow our orders to the letter. Even after all those months, nobody knows where she lives. She only shows herself when she deems it necessary. Soon you come to know of a lot less better, and you see that they truly believe in what they are doing. At present, they are trying to expand their ranks and convince the common folk that the present order in the Empire can and must be fought. You can do this. You have to believe you can't do this. You have to do whatever Sophia says. Some of the students you rescued are also here. With their arrival, the ranks of the Lotless practically doubled. The events of the college turned them against the current system. They are eager to act, and so are you. Sophia meets with every new commoner in private. It takes a few days before she finally speaks to you, too. Sophia is sitting at a desk behind a pile of papers. She looks worn out, but still smiles at you. Hi. There is, there's a reason I wanted to talk to you last. 
Our ranks are growing, but not everyone is as smart and learned and cunning as you. Really? I haven't even gotten to the next level of any of them. But, uh, you know, I I'm working on it. Um, anyway, uh, what was I? Um, I need results. And I expect to get them from you. We have to tell the common folk the truth about what happened at the college. It doesn't matter how we do it. The Lotless will never forget, and we will never forgive the nobles for what they did. We have to tell people we exist, and we have to recruit new members. I know you can think of a way to do both. I expect a report in a week, in one week, at our next meeting. Good luck. Sophia stops talking and looks at you. You nod. There is something else you want to tell her, but you have no plan just yet. And, it's she, and it seems she has no time for small talk. You leave the meeting room. What will you do now? How can you tell people about the Lotless without everyone getting arrested? The best place to do this would be somewhere on the outskirts of the city, in the markets and taverns where commoners spend, tend to gather. You spend the rest of the day strolling through the cities. After a night of pondering, you have three ideas. Your first idea is the safest. Print a lot of leaflets and spread them all across Eterna. Tiny papers are easy to hand out, and all it takes is a few printed words that hit home, and a printing press. Can you even find a print shop that will support your cause? Plan number two. Talk about the lot list to anyone willing to lend an ear. This is a more reliable option. After all, people tend to believe other people more than words on paper. It's more dangerous, too. It's easier to arrest an orator than an author, and your numbers are too few as it is. Plus, I mean, but... To criticize the, uh, pamphlets, you leave behind a paper trail. And leaving behind a paper trail is, uh, well, let's just say that's kind of stupid. And then there's plan number three. The city is still abuzz after what happened at the college. Someone, somewhere on those frantic streets are people willing to heed your call, instead of wasting time and effort telling everyone about the lot list. Perhaps you should focus on recruiting. Print leaflets, manipulation, greater than ten, which... Not quite. Condemn the nobles. Willpower greater than zero. It's now five. Recruit members. You start combing the city taverns and public houses, searching for more like-minded people among the students and the young. Hmm. Let's condemn the nobles. You gather the students you rescued a few days ago and ask them a question. Are they ready to tell people the truth about what happened? They cheer to that. Of course. Everyone should know about the injustice perpetrated by the nobles and what Archduke Monroe said. And those who experienced it firsthand at the college should be the ones to spread the word. You discuss the details of the plan together. Right now all you have to do is open their eyes, convince them that this has to stop, get them ready. There's no need to identify yourselves as the lotless just yet. That would only cause doubt and suspicion. You have to do this step by step. And step one is to make the commoners of Eterna realize how the nobles and Arthians are treating them, and make sure they know about the incident at the college. Once you are certain that this has been done, recruiting new members will be easier. Right now you should describe the lawless yourselves, as you would describe someone else. There was a group of people who rescued the students. They risked their lives to save innocent lives. If they risked themselves to, in to save innocent lives, nobody should get caught. Keep talking until you are sure everyone understands this. If there is a risk, they should run. They should not begin until they are in a place crowded with commoners, like the outskirts of the city or the markets. The ex-students nod to you. Their faces are serious. One of them furrows his brow in concentrations as though he would prefer to write it all down. There are no questions, however. You spread out across the streets of Eterna early next morning in groups of three. The plan is simple. Two of the members of each group will find a place in the market, where they can be heard by merchants and passerbys. Then, start loudly discussing the college incident. Once they've attracted enough gawkers, one of them will get up onto a platform of some kind and loudly tell everyone about the incident. The third member will keep watch a ways away in case the gendarmes come. You meet back in the evening and share the day's results. Three of you had to run away from the gendarmes, but the others were more successful. One young man has even got a few drinks at the tavern, and his friends had to help him back. You agree to continue the next day. Three days of speeches is enough to fill the streets of Eterna with rumors. Soon you start hearing people talking. The 
nobles have done it this time. We better do something. It's time for a change. The next time you meet Sophia, she rewards you with reserved praise. Well done, Bronte. I expect nothing less from you. I'm glad to have you among us. Eloquence plus one, scheming plus one, and willpower minus five. But you know what? We got more scheming and we got more eloquence. That is perfect for me. And I think it'll have to be here that we leave this video since we are at the time limit. So I hope you all enjoyed this video. Give a like button a stop if you did. Subscribe if you want more death in your life. Be sure the bell is tolling for thee. Until next time, rest in peace. Bye! Enjoyed today's video? Well, there's plenty more for you to enjoy here. And if you also want to support this small channel, then there is also my Kofi, which is available, as well as a Twitter thread that gives you my commissioning info. And if you'd like some traditional art or literature, feel free to DM me on Twitter. Thank you for enjoying the video and for your viewership.